guck dir, guck an. Was haben wir? Ähm, Kekse. Monster, guck dir Monster Kekse. Die sind schon offen. Super. Krümelmonsters. Weil der. Nee, ne? <lacht> das ist gut. Das ist hervorragend. Die lassen wir so im Bild, ne? Das ist super. Das ist ja Hammer. Dann nehme ich den nehme ich mit auf die Bühne, da wird ein Foto, müssen wir ein Foto mitmachen. Pass auf. Warte. No! Oh shit! Hey, it's Marco Miniman. How's it going there? I'm gonna eat some cookies here, I guess. Actually, some amazing uh, Cookie Monster muffins I was given. But uh, in any case, it's me, Marco Miniman, and you're watching something. <laughs> Um, yes, the essence of drumming is to me, well, you know, a good sound, a good feel. Actually, I'm reading this off the pad because it says real feel. So <laughs> and basically holding music together and kind of, you know, complementing music, unless you have a solo spot where you're allowed to go over the top. But um, yeah, the essence of drumming to me always kind of, it's the pizza dough of the music, isn't it? You know, that's why, that's how I see it, you know, so that the topics, toppings can fit tastefully on top. <laughs> How do I learn on, on, uh, with drums? I introduce each question or each answer with a rudiment of my choice. Let's see, this one is going to be the drag, single drag. So, <laughs> yeah, I went, I, I mean, I went when, when I was like five years old to learn organ into music school. And then uh, later on drums, I had like two teachers only for a little bit of time. <laughs> and then I kind of started to study on my own and kind of wanting to learn certain things. I mean, of course, I learned how to read and stuff, but. I only always had a vision, you know, and, and wanted to kind of translate it somehow. And I, I'm autodidact, I'm self-taught. I can't do anything else. I can't even cook a proper meal. So <laughs> it's the only thing I can stick with. See, the cookie monsters agree. <laughs> um, how do I learn? I think really I'm learning through songwriting. I just love writing songs and I always did. You know, I started actually off playing organ, you know, and then actually switched to guitar and then drums. And I kept this going, so when I write songs, you know, this is like a process, you know, when I kind of construct an entire piece of music, pretty much using guitar, bass, or, you know, keyboard, and, um, yeah, and drum set. And, and then you kind of, you know, learn really how to kind of, you know, function in a very musical way as a drummer, since we have drum talk here right now. And um, that, to me, is always when you learn things about sound, perspective, and space, and... Uh, playing the right things at the right time. Mm. What's, uh, what do I do to get better? Um, play with more experience, play with more people. And uh, actually, you know what, here's the funny thing, to get really better, well, it is the experience, you know, to kind of, you know, that you absorb to kind of really play with different musicians and, and, and kind of absorbing, yeah, like I said, like, you know, having kind of a history with that and then kind of just know how to compose for certain components in music. That is something to really get better. Know how to write for different instruments is a big deal. Oof, good question. Have my ways of thinking of like in regular life yes. changed through drumming? I tell you what, that's a good question. Drumming is to be kind of rhythmically organized or rhythmically focused. So I tell you what, you know, there's like a thing, you know, like a certain rhythm, you know, during your day you know, that you kind of follow in a rhythmic path. But I think, you know, the only thing that I like really of, of what drumming and, and kind of, you know, every everyday life kind of combines is that you kind of walk through the city and sometimes, you know, think of a feel or think of a groove and kind of, you know, have a certain kind of, you know, thing where you kind of sit in the bus and go like, here's the rudiment for the day. <laughs> Which is a double paradiddle now. Uh. <laughs> so yeah, that answer was kind of, you know, very dissatisfying, wasn't it? No, but that's, that's, that's pretty much, you know, what I can say. No, I guess, you know, essentially drums don't change your life, but I like, like your everyday kind of activities or something. But uh, <laughs> the rudiment for that is a rhythm cue. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely not. Sometimes a bit of both. Let's put it that way. There's actually organized sections where you have to kind of deliver what is written out and then you have to kind of, you know, repeat these things. I, and, and I love the improvisational part. You know, it would be like almost like as if you repeat yourself, if, if, as if we would do the interview tomorrow at a different place and I kind of write exactly out what I just said and repeat it. The meaning is the same, you know, but I kind of use different phrasings. Because, you know, sometimes you're with different people in a different room, you know, so you want to kind of entertain differently. And it's the same, you know, with music. And I think, I think it's actually very, very essential also to uh, work with the room, you know. If you have like a big room and you have like, you know, a huge reverb, I structure or the placements of hits, fills and grooves a bit different to make it sound different. Sometimes I even change tempos to play it kind of a bit slower you know, for example, when there's like more reverb in the room. So if you have like a good percentage of both, you know, then I guess, you know, you're, you have the right path. And well, you know, partially I have to kind of agree with that chess kind of thing or kind of move towards that. There are certain moments when, you know, we play like so certain solo sections where I think, okay, I'm gonna start with a certain pattern, but then feel wise kind of plan on going to like a tom fill to then kind of go to a right pattern or something like that and kind of, you know, increase dynamic to then kind of, you know, introduce the next part. So yes, you know, I think about these things wisely, but I'm also purposely um, concerned life about to destruct, or, uh, yeah, to destroy basically routine. Because it's the worst thing on tour that can happen. If like a band feels too routine and kind of just plays like machines, you know, that are kind of, you know, trained to do that and kind of experienced to do that. So I always surprise the players in the band or, you know, myself then as well, you know, to, with different things. And I kind of, you know, think about what I'm going to do and I'm going to sometimes change rhythmic patterns or dynamic structures or entire groove structures to where it can be changed, of course, you know, you can't just do it on a composed piece, you know. But, um, and that's great. And you see like, you know, sometimes you know, like, you know, the bass player or the guitar player kind of smiling at you and then the mission is accomplished. It's just about really having fun, you know. Well, you know, this is kind of a, a, a weird thing because I really always sort of played professionally because uh, I started playing live at a very young age when I was 13 years old. I played with local jazz bands and then with 15, 16 toured and did like, you know, had I like this, this reggae kind of band as well and then, you know, played in various projects and then started with a band called the Freaky Fucking Weirdos from uh, Munich. And that was already, yeah, being professional. I mean, you know, we were touring around, living the dream, playing in shitty clubs. and <laughs> But it was fun. I really got to say that, you know. And so, yeah, I, know any, I didn't know anything different. And of course, you know, then things started to establish more and more and more. Or the artists, you know, you played with got bigger, you know. In um, H Block's defense, you know, it was a bigger band, you know. And, and we did have fun times, played bigger festivals and then also... Uh, later with uh, Udo Lindenberg or something. Those are serious gigs and he's a really serious musician, you know, like a serious artist. Then actually I think later it was Paul Gilbert, you know, guitar player I worked with in, in the States and, and then with the ongoing success with the DVDs I released or books, you know, it, you know I played, started playing with the Buddy Rich big band on one of them and then, you know, it kind of somehow moved on into different territories but it never was where you have one moment where you go like, hang on, you just cross the border right now here and wow, this is it. No, that happens, you know, kind of slowly because you're concentrated on, or at least I am on just delivering good music, you know, and kind of um, doing this with ultimate passion. And, um, and if it's all of, all, all of a sudden succeeding or something, or, you know, some things get a good response, then it's a fantastic bonus. Rudiment for that would be a single flam. <laughs> I'm dreaming of the inflatable drum kit. <laughs> that would be amazing because, you know, you can just, you know, like a mattress inflate it and then, you know, you can just start playing. That would be great. Wouldn't that be awesome? You like, you know, just get your specs on. No, you know, I think some things on the drum product front um, sometimes could be changed back. You know, like, for example, foot pedals. People keep 
so much kind of messing around with like foot pedals. What was wrong with the regular single chain 5000? It reacted fantastic. It just was like really direct. Your foot did the work. It just feels great. Why do we need all this other stuff? But <laughs> anyways, there are some good products and I'm, I'm, you know, especially on the front, like what like your cable Hyatt's did or like, you know, uh, many fracturings, you know, with, with, with wood and, and, and shells got really better. Meanwhile, you know, you get like for 900 bucks an amazing drum kit like PDP series or something that sound like a four or $5,000 drum set. So that is actually quite cool. Mm. The rudiment for adjusting the camera will be a quintuplet. Um, probably, okay, uh, let, let's see. Uh, let's do something that we're playing right now um, live. It's called Desert Tornado. And it's from uh, the uh, Aristocrats album Culture Clash. And the groove goes like that. That was one of the songs usually I write from guitar or, or from bass or keyboards or something. But sometimes I have drum patterns and I think like, oh, hang on, I'm gonna remember that and maybe do something with it. And so that one uh, was basically the foundation for Desert Tornado. Uh, And it goes like. Yeah. You can do anything, right? I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, what I do is just, I mess around on the drum kit with like, you know, all sorts of ideas, you know, and uh, being creative and kind of just, you know, constructing things and kind of composing on the spot. And then I kind of, uh, or then go to certain territories where I know, okay, I want to go to a 916th and then I want to kind of play a quintuplet on top and let's see how it sounds like. And if it sounds good, I'm gonna keep it. If it doesn't sound good, I move on to something else. But then all of a sudden, magically, there's like one pattern that you like, where you think like, hang on, this sounds good. Okay, let's do it again. You know, and then, and then I basically keep it and do something with it. And it can be completely sometimes out of the blue, you know. <clears throat> but I think, you know, you can just on the spot construct something and do something musical with it. You know, I don't know, like, let's pick a tempo or a time signature. You tell me, let's see. Or Doubles. Doubles. Right, at the same time? No, it could be linear. Oh, okay. And then basically create only stuff with doubles. And then you have some accents and then you think, okay, where can I put my... I like that. I would kind of come up with something. You want it kind of at a slow tempo or a really fast one or... Play it S slow and groovy and then at double time the same pattern. Okay. Similar. Sounds good. Okay, here we go. little quintuplet in <laughs> insert. That's what I would come up right now on the spot with like, but that's kind of based on the double with an accent on the second double. Um, created on, uh, on real feel pad. <laughs> Oh, when was the last time I surprised myself on my instrument? That was probably one of the last gigs I did where I dropped actually sticks during my drum solo. <laughs> actually, that's not a surprise, isn't it? That fucking happens all the time. No, actually, but uh, I was very surprised when I once, during a Joe Satriani gig, lost both drumsticks at the same time, almost. It was like, literally just like two seconds later or something. Like, I played and wanted to kind of do a fill hit the tom in front of me, the stick kind of bounced off from the tom, flew back into my, <laughs> to my left hand and kind of literally accelerated and kind of, you know, yeah, basically I dropped my, my, my second stick from that hand, kind of literally bounced off that stick and I was all of a sudden stickless. And I remember like being like, ah! yelling at my drum tech going like, ah! and 
so I kind of, you know, started playing with hands while I was kind of somehow kind of trying to make a move and get like pick up other drumsticks. And the funny thing is later on, I tried to explain it. Where is it? I tried to explain it actually to uh, Joe and, and, and Mike Keneally on stage. And uh, I said like, did you actually see what happened? And then Mike was like, yeah, I was wondering, you know, because all of a sudden it sounded like Moby Dick. <laughs> so yeah, that, that surprised me, definitely. Uh, but yeah, it's always a hit and miss, you know, with these kind of, you know, Oh, this one. There's like one. Wait. See? And sometimes these things fall. <laughs> this is actually great. It's a good question. I like this a lot. Um, it took me literally over a decade to, f to make really the right choice, instrumentation-wise, where I think like, hang on. And a lot of experimentation happened, like, having a little foot snare and try to involve that. Some cymbals that I sometimes didn't like how they sounded or drums that were kind of too, either way too tiny or too you know, weird from the sizes. These things you learn actually over the years, again, with experience. And um, I have pretty much now a standard drum set, <clears throat> which is a 24 inch kick drum because it really sounds massive and you know, nice and big and has a nice uh, difference to the toms. Uh, and toms, usually I go for 10, 12, and then 16, 18. I kind of skipped the 14, and I also kind of lost the 8. You know, so that is actually a nice melodic feel, but still ends kind of, you know, in like a really low end rumble, you know, if I want to. And snare drum, I usually use a 14 inch as a main snare, preferably either way like a solid maple shell or actually a superphonic Ludwig kind of style steel. Uh, uh, body and then as a side snare I play actually 13 inch and I never really use too many China crashes on and off I, I will if somebody really asks for the sound but usually it's sort of bigger crash cymbals like starting from 16, 18, 20, 110 inch splash, two bells, 120 inch pretty dry ride uh, because I don't like a lot of white noise you know buzzing around and this is pretty much it. This is like, uh, oh yeah, and then a, a double pedal or a second kick drum and two hi-hats, like one main hi-hat and then one remote hi-hat that I can also play with my foot on the right side. And that's pretty much, you know, the essence of my playing. It's actually not a really huge drum set, but I can do a lot of damage with, with it, I think. <laughs> Okay, and the final rudiment for today will be, since it's the final rudiment, a single stroke roll. And thank you so much for your time. I'm on my way to soundcheck, and uh, you are watching Drum Talk, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm gonna start e eating cookies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>